Run away again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See what the Lord has for us today, Amen. 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 I'm going to make it. Doggone it. That's right. Amen. Amen. We all work right. together. <clears throat> Nothing will steal the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> as you know, we are in the book of Devarim or Deuteronomy, and this week's particular portion of Parsha is Re'eh, and Sort of, you know, paint the backdrop here a little bit. Moshe, as you know, is continuing to prepare. To prepare the people to enter the promised land. Scripture says they are to own it. And they are to live in it. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that what we're supposed to own it? And we're supposed to live in it. Own who you are in Yeshua and live in Yeshua. Own it. If you confess it, if you believe in it, then you live it. Live it. We're going to touch on that a little bit later. So the manner in which they live in it is emphasized with specific instructions our portion today in Mitzvah. For example... The people are not to just avoid, as I said earlier, but they are to destroy any idols that they come in contact with. We have a responsibility as believers to not just say, well, that's, you know, that's not how I live, or that's not what I do because I'm a follower of Yeshua. <laughs> no, it's not like that. You just thought, oh, I don't touch that. No, you step up and you deal with it. You deal with it. You destroy it, the scripture says. Amen? Amen. Right. It might be a point of view that's idolic. You destroy that point of view with argument, with scripture. Destroy it. They are to worship and tithe. Worship and tithe at the place Hashem designates. Not that you just decide to go to or worship a fellowship at. It's where Hashem designates. Amen? Amen? And if they continue to want to eat meat, that was a, a desire of their hearts. It wasn't required of us. We weren't made to eat meat. But if they want to eat it, they are to eat only the designated clean meats. And importantly, they are to refrain from the blood. So that means their steaks now will be well done, brothers and sisters. No rare or medium rare. They are to never return to the world that they had left and its ways. And finally, it's, Moshe said that God's going to test you. What a shocker, right? He's going to test you. He's going to test your discernment. And you know how he's going to test your discernment? It's right there in the Word. He's going to test your discernment with false prophets. He's going to test your discernment with false prophets to see if you really will get sucked into their delusion. Everything I commanded you, declared Moshe, you are to do. Now, as we discussed a few Shabbats back, even though he had a change of heart, Moshe will not be accompanying them on their final leg of their journey. Moshe had pleaded a few Shabbats back. We talked about it. He had pleaded. He had pleaded for God to reconsider. But God said, enough about the matter. My mind is made up. But he does grant a small concession for Moshe. And that is, before his passing, Moshe was allowed to climb to the summit of Mount Nevo and to gaze upon, the scripture says, the entire length and breadth of the land. North, south, east, and west. Which presents us with a number of questions. I think we need to reconcile a bit. First of all, wouldn't, I mean, if you think about that, wouldn't you think, considering <coughs> Moshe's circumstances, the consequences of his anger, wouldn't showing Moshe after he's, you know, striven for 40 years to get the people this place, to have him go to this mountaintop and have this tantalizing view of the land, 
Wouldn't it be kind of like kicking a man while he's down? I mean, it's okay to ask questions like that, brothers and sisters. That's part of the process of wrestling with the Word of God and wrestling with God himself and some of the choices that he makes. And, and furthermore, even from his vantage point on this high mountaintop, how was he able to see the entire expanse of the land all the way to the most distant borders? How is that possible? And if it was miraculous, why did he have to go up to the mountaintop at all? Why didn't Hashem simply just show him some miraculous vision? Right? Right? Do you ever hear that? Some people have these miraculous visions. Clean it, clean it. This message has brought me to tears already. <laughs> Hashem uh, <clears throat> simply show him the same miraculous vision, like I said, right at sea level. I want you to stop and consider something for a moment. What exactly, what exactly did Moshe see? What did he see from that mountaintop? What sort of panoramic view could even partially compensate for his failure to enter the Holy Land? And here's the answer. The answer to that question lies in the difference between sight and insight. Sight and insight. Now, maybe for Moshe, it wasn't all about the beautiful land or the pretty flowers that adorned the valleys. Perhaps it wasn't climbing that spectacular mountain to feast his eyes on the beauty of the land. No, I believe, I believe this. I believe Moshe's gaze was beyond the beautiful land that was in his sight. I believe he was looking within. I believe he was looking within and beneath the surface to connect with the spiritual core or dynamic of the moment. I believe the essence of what this land represented through observation, insight, and ultimate knowledge was what Moshe was looking at and taking in. Earlier when Moshe was a fugitive in the land of Midian, you remember, the Torah tells us he saw the bush engulfed in flames, right? And said, why isn't this bush being consumed? Good question. Something's burning. Why is it being consumed? Did you ever wonder that? Rabbinical sages, they speculate like everybody else. They speculate that Hashem rewarded Moshe for turning to look at the bush. Just the fact that he even noticed the bush. Now, what was so praiseworthy is my question about turning to look at a burning bush that's being, or not being, I should say, consumed. What's the big deal about that? You know, obviously, anybody walking by would say, oh, yeah, there's a bush burning. You know? Well, what's the reward there for noticing the obvious, right? That's the point. Clearly, clearly Moshe was not being rewarded for simply looking at the bush. The rabbis believe it was Moshe looking beyond appearances. Looking beyond appearances and probing for the essence that earned him an everlasting reward. Whereas any ordinary man, any ordinary person might have seen some vegetation in a state of combustion, Moshe looked deeper. He looked at the symbolism of what was taking place. The image, he thought, of the Jewish people, the writhing in flames of Jewish or Egyptian slavery, but divinely protected from destruction. You know, some of you know who John Maxwell is. And he once said this. It's a good word. Vision is the ability to see, the faith to believe, and the courage to do. See, insight, brothers and sisters, is not just merely perceiving, but being able to see the big picture, the broader picture, the larger scope of life. It's being able to take a step back from a situation and to gain a larger perspective. We always get so caught up with the immediate. But how often do we kind of step back and say, let me take this in for a minute. What's going on here and why? The scope of things. i share this a my son, Michael Shalom, one day was talking. He was sharing with me some of the things that was on his heart, what he's wrestling with. <clears throat> the big picture of our own family journey in the last five, six years. 
thought to be father and son, and uh, trying to sort of get his head around the big picture of that. All of my children are walking through that process, trying to get their heads around everything that's happened, what they've heard, and what they haven't heard. And I shared this with him <clears throat> from uh, Chuck Swindoll. Chuck had, uh, talking about insight, said, did you know that you blink 25 times every minute? Did you know that? 25, we, we don't, you know, just, we really don't pay attention to it, it happens. But we blink 25 times every minute. Now, each blink takes up about one-fifth of a second. Let's see where I'm going with this. So, <clears throat> did she just drive to Tennessee? How long did it take you to get there? Nine about nine, let's say ten hours for the sake of my illustration. Okay, he, he drove nine hours. Okay, I want to share something with you about the nine hours that you spent on the road. On a ten-hour automobile trip, if you're averaging, let's say, 40 miles an hour, which I'm sure you weren't even close to. <laughs> <laughs> But let's say, let's say at a 40 miles per hour average, do you realize you're going to drive 20 miles with your eyes closed? You drive 20 miles with your eyes closed. Now, I know a fact that's even more surprising than that. And again, quoting from Pastor Chuck Sundahl. The surprising fact is that some people go through life with their eyes closed. They look, but they really don't see. They observe the surface, but they omit the underneath. They focus on images, but not on the issues. Vision is present, but perception is is absent. If life were a painting, says Pastor Chuck, they would see colors, but not the genius behind the strokes. If they were on a journey, they would notice the road, but they would overlook the majestic, awesome scenery. We see that more and more today with smartphones. First thing my kids do when they get in the car is they pick up their smartphones. And I have to say, put those things down. You're going to look out the window and see life. If we were at a meal, I'm hungry. You would eat and drink, right? But you would overlook the exquisite beauty of the china or the delicate touch of wine in the sauce. If it were a poem, they would read print on a page but miss altogether the passion of the poet. Remove insight, brothers and sisters, and you suddenly reduce life to existence. Existence with frequent flashes of boredom and indifference. Those without insight dwell mainly in the realm of the obvious, the expected, the essentials. The dimensions that interest them are length and width, but not depth. And me speaking here, one with a lack of insight fixates on what is immediately in sight. That's where your focus is. That's where your attention is. That's where your energy lies. That's where it ends, what is in sight. You know, one of the classic illustrations of my point, and you'll get it right away from a movie. Okay, you ready for it? Did everybody get it? Yes. Didn't get it? Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence. Sand the floor. Sand. Now, young Daniel LaRusso was frustrated by days and days of this menial labor 
And he got to the point where he had enough. So I'm done. I came here to work Friday. I haven't learned anything. Mr. Miyagi goes, Danielson! He goes, he threw a punch out. Show me. Wax out, wax out. Threw a punch out. Throws a punch again. Paint the fence. And suddenly, suddenly, Daniel had insight. He was focusing on the obvious and what was insight. The wax on and the wax off and the painting of the fence. But he never saw beyond. And Mr. Miyagi took him to the place of insight beyond the obvious. When Yeshua healed the blind man, he asked him, do you see anything? Very rhetorical question. Do you see anything, brothers and sisters? Do you see anything? The man replied, well, I see men as trees walking. He could see. He had eyesight now, but he was confused. He couldn't process the obvious. Not until Yeshua did what? Touched his eyes again. When he touched his eyes again, did he see clearly? Not only now that he has sight, but he had insight to make sense of what he was seeing. It was not enough to see. He had to in-see. That's how the Greek puts it. I see in Greek is blepo. That's in Mark 8, verse 24. And then we go to verse 25. And we go from I see in verse 24 to verse 25 when it becomes he in saw. And they blepem. And they blepem. The, the, he in saw. He saw in. Simply stated. Seeing what is in sight without insight is seeing without understanding. Seeing without discerning significance, brothers and sisters, is not really seeing at all. You don't see a thing. Please understand, I, I, I'm not here to be critical of those who struggle or cannot go any deeper in life. Some people are just plain very simple. They're just very simple people. And the, and the reality of our lives is some are just not going to get it. They're not. And God's grace is sufficient for them. But that doesn't mean we stop there. Or at least we, we strive, we strive to do more, to be more. But I don't mean to be critical of them. But I am critical of certain kinds of people. I'm critical of those kind of people who can but will not. Who can go deeper, but will not, choose not to. I'm not pointing my finger at inability. I'm pointing my finger at refusal. And I'll give you a concrete illustration of that. The boatload of Talmudim in Mark chapter 6. Boatload of disciples. Immediately, of course, you remember after Yeshua had miraculously, miraculously fed thousands of people with loaves and fish, what did he do? He sent his men away in a boat, and he slipped off the mountainside to, to pray, to be alone with the Lord. Well, while Tommy and he are out there in, in, you know, in the sea there, what happens? The storm breaks out, and uh, they're filled with panic. They're freaking out. And he came to the rescue shortly thereafter, and, and you know, so he, he, he calmed the sea, and he stilled the wind, and he assured them that there was no reason to be afraid. So, the Gospel writer Mark makes a comment that's very worth remembering. Again, Mark 6, verses 51 to 52. He got into the boat with them, Yeshua, and the wind ceased. And they were completely astounded, for they did not understand. About the wind ceasing? No. They were still dealing with the loads. They did not understand about the loads. On the contrary, their hearts had been made stone-like. Stone-like. See, it wasn't that they were unable to understand. They didn't want to understand. Right? 
When there's a conflict, how often do your brother and sister say, I don't want to know. I don't want any drama in my life. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to hear about it. Because you don't want to understand. There are people that choose that. I'm sick of talking about politics. I'm sick about talking about our family. I'm sick about talking about my job. I'm sick about it. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to know. William Barclay of Glasgow says, their minds, speaking of Tom and Dave, were obtuse. You might remember from the Shawshank Redemption. The, when that word was used, obtuse. That was the root problem. These men were insensitive. They were dull. They were lacking discernment. And strictly, they were unteachable. They're unteachable. They weren't morons by nature, but by choice. By choice. And therein rested not the tragedy, but the blame. They didn't need Yeshua's pity as much as they deserved their rebuke. Right? When we go to the kingdom <laughs> and we are held accountable for our choices and what we say and do, it's either going to be, you know, it's either going to be blessing or rebuke. It says right here in our portion, blessing or curse. Right? Yeah. It's one or the other. By now, from all the teaching that they had received from the Master and all the miracles they witnessed from Him, their insight should have been keenly developed. Keenly developed. Had they applied what they observed earlier that day when the thousands were fed, their response to the storm should have been very insightful. They would have got it. They didn't want, they didn't want to get it. Then we are introduced to Rabbi Shaul in Scripture, in Acts. And when he's introduced in the Scripture, what is he doing? What's he doing? He's going with papers down to Damasek or Damascus to gather up the people of the way and bring them back to Jerusalem, tied and in chains to be killed. Till now he believes God is blessed with his zeal to kill God's chosen, his children. But the Spirit reveals how blind he is on the inside. See, when you are blind on the inside, you call right wrong, and you call wrong right. I think one of the biggest tragedies in the church today is how much we have allowed for so much that is wrong and accommodated it. We've even gone so far to say it was right. And again, have we confronted the idols and destroyed them? No. no we, have, we, we just lay down. We just lay down. We allow it to happen. Right? Do you want, a, you want a congregational example? You ready for that? Who's ready for it? Nah, nobody's ready for it. You never are. I will give you one, though. When a congregant is called out on a serious area of sin in their life, and then responds not with humility, but with sowing discord and dissension by chastising leadership and drawing fellow congregants away to his Torah study, they are rewarded. They're not called on it. They're rewarded by fellow congregants with dinners, expressions of support, invites to dance, and financial assistance. Though you can see on the outside, the learned Rabbi Shaul didn't see a thing on the inside. He was clueless on the inside. Not until he was confronted by a greater light than the light he saw even on the outside. Because when we look at the sun, it's pretty bright, isn't it? Right. Well, this light was brighter than the sun. Acts 26, 13 to 14, when I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my traveling companions, we all fell to the ground, and then I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, Shaul, Shaul, why do you keep persecuting me? Brothers and sisters, you know one of the best gifts you'll ever receive? You want to know one of the best gifts you'll ever receive? So God confronts you. 
That's one of the best gifts you'll ever receive when God confronts you. It's a gift when he sabotages your plans. When he sabotages your mission, sabotages your plans, interrupts what you're trying to do, it's God doing you a favor. Failure is a favor. So he's laying there on the ground, and he said, who are you, sir? And the voice spoke out of the light and says, I am Yeshua, and you are persecuting me. And now you can tell. Now you know. He's been transformed. Now you know he's been exposed to a greater light, because up until this point, Shaul had been given the orders. He was a big dog. He's a big guy. He's given all the orders. But now, what's happened? He's following orders. He's following orders. Get up. Stand on your feet, dude. Yes, sir. He gets up. The guy who thought he knew what he was doing, I'm going to down to kill Yeshua followers, now he's being told what to do. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something that's very, very important. Because when God tests you, this is going to be your opportunity to find out whether you're truly born again and spirit-filled. And you know how, one way you really know Humility. Humility. Humility is the sign of conversion. Humility. When, some, when you see somebody who is not humble, I'm going to tell you right now, they have not been transformed. They have not been converted. Strong word. Because humility is a sign that you've encountered something bigger than you. Humility means that God has sent a light brighter than the light you are walking in and brought you to your knees. When Shaul finally stood up, trust me, he was seeing things a lot differently. A lot differently. Initially, he couldn't see his own men. But now the man who could see on the outside and was blind on the inside <laughs> now has become blind on the outside so he can see on the inside. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now he walks away. And the men he was once leading are doing what? <laughs> leading him. They're leading him because he lost sight of the world. But his insight is so strong, so strong at that point that the man that couldn't find his way to Damascus gives us now most of the apostolic writings. What Rabbi Shaul is communicating in essence is I am willing to give up the light I had for the light I needed on the inside. So behold, brothers and sisters, insight. Insight humbled me. Insight birthed my ministry. Insight caused me to be the primary writer contributor to apostolic writings. He writes blinded on the outside, but he's sighted on the inside. When he writes to the congregation in Ephesus, he poured so much of his life into that congregation. That, that was a tough one. They were all about the world. All about the world. He was so concerned about sustaining them. A lot of his, a lot of his writings are about how can we sustain what we've planted here. It's got to keep going. You got to think about what you have in your life to sustain your relationship with the Lord. It's one thing to believe, but how do you sustain it? How do you keep it going? What's your plan to sustain it? Amen? Amen? Now you would think Rabbi Shaul, writing to Ephesus, that he would be bitter because he never completely regained his sight. But he doesn't regret a thing. There are no uh, prayers to have his eyesight restored fully. Did you hear any of those prayers? Did he say anywhere, please, God, give my sight back? I, don't, I didn't read any, did you? No, I didn't see any. There's no request for that. In fact, he's praying for them. He's praying for the people around him. That the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened. He said, what I see on the inside is much more important than what you see on the outside. Instead of you praying for my eyes to be healed, I'm praying for yours to be healed because the truth of the matter is though you had to lead me around I can see better than you. I can see better than you. 
You can see out, and I can see in. So I pray that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, not out light, but in light, insight. You know, years ago, Linda did a uh, great teaching on Hebrews, really did a good one. And when we read from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11, 14, that, the context of that is really really has much to say about today's followers and common eagle disciples. It's speaking today. Speaking to us today. And it says, verses 11 to 14, we have much to say about this subject, but it is hard to explain because you have become sluggish in understanding. For although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the very first principles of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a baby. Without experience in applying the word about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature. For those whose faculties have been trained by continuous exercise to distinguish good from evil. Hours upon hours they have logged being taught the word along with multiple opportunities to apply these truths, but the passage says some have become sluggish in understanding. They're thick, they're lazy, they're sluggish, they're lacking insight. You know what maturity is? Maturity? Maturity is a result of mixing insight with taking what you have had revealed to you and then actually <laughs> doing it and applying it. Applying it. It's so rare today. <coughs> it is so rare today. And that's why the world has so many inroads, not only so much command of the world that we live in today, but command into the body of Messiah now. We've lost our power. We've lost our authority. We've lost our enlightenment. We don't see it. And so the discernment between good and evil, brought about by trained senses, the word says, is frequently absent. Now, hear me. I've covered a lot of ground here. I want to tell you what Moshe was trying to teach us, what Yeshua was trying to teach us, what Rabbi Shaul was trying to teach us, what the author of Hebrews is trying to teach us, is that insight is better than eyesight. Insight is the goal, not dealing with what is insight. See, in our own times, this contemporary culture that we live in, and the media that we deal with on an increasing basis, bombards us. Bombards us with many eye-catching images. Oh, look there. Look there, it's pretty. Oh, look at that. Do you ever watch a commercial subjectively? You don't like, listen, you don't watch it, but you step back and you watch it. I, 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 I watch it insightfully, not sightfully. Because I'm like, oh, we're, we're, we're being enculturated. Do you know that in your commercials? Watch your commercials sometimes. Just make an observation and see what you are being presented with. You can see the agenda, social agenda that's going on in your commercials. What is, what is acceptable and un unacceptable to the world in Hollywood. And you're being fed that over and over. That's insight, brothers and sisters. That's insight. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen? Amen? That's what happens is that we are, we are being bombarded with so many eye-catching images, we have become spiritually blinded, ironically, by the myriad wondrous sights around us. Blinded by sights. Think about that. We're blinded by the stuff that we see. And it sometimes seems our sight has become so overloaded that we have lost sight of insight. But we all have it. 
within our power to look with a more penetrating gaze, like Moshe did, with more than our retinas and our optic nerves can deal with. And if we do so, we're going to discover something. Try it. Try it sometime. Because you're going to find a far deeper level to existence in the world that you live in, whose sight is rewarded by insight. Remember, there's a lot of difference between the necessary blinking that we do and unnecessary blindness. One is by choice and one is not. For I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It's amazing grace. I challenge you this morning, brothers and sisters. I want to challenge you. Because to me, if I were to isolate any one area of our lives as believers, it is this area primarily. is our, our inability to look beyond what is insight and have the perceptive insight that we need. To look through a situation, beyond the situation, beyond the obvious. To have that penetrating spiritual gaze. To step back and take a panoramic look at the circumstances, the situation, and wonder what the heck God is doing in this. And sometimes you understand, and sometimes you won't. But at least the idea you have that God is doing something, and I want to know what it is. That is insight. And I challenge you, this Shabbat, and from everyone beyond this one, to quit living your life driving blind. Quit driving blind. Pray Yeshua is going to open up your heart eyes and pray that Yeshua will help you see. Re'e. See. And if you want that, you will sing this song. You will sing it as a prayer. You will sing it because you want that to happen. Because that's what you desire in your heart. You desire for your heart to be open. Amen?
Peace be with Father, as we close our eyes and pray, we pray you open up our eyes to our hearts. The Lord, that we see like we've never seen before, that we ignore the obvious, that we move beyond, Father, what is the obvious, but into the significance, the panorama of your, of your spirit at work, Father, in our lives and the world around us. That we see, Father, the work of the enemy, that we see the work of your hands, that we distinguish between the two, and that, Father, that we are not passive in our involvement, but active, Father. That we are actively involved, Father, in trying to discern and to see what is at work, what you are doing, and, Father, to help others along in that process. Father, your stern rebuke and those who refuse, but, Father, your grace reward for those who choose to see. Father, we thank you for what you brought forth today. We pray, Lord, that if our eyes have been blinded or scales have taken a cataracts to our spirit, Father, we pray that you would clear, clear our eyes and put a fresh lens, Father, of clarity of your spirit that we see like we've never seen before, unobstructed, with great clarity. In the shoes name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ivrik Yahweh Vaish Marecha Tzadonai Panavalecha Vichanecha Tzadonai Panavalecha Vesim Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and I pray the Lord will lift his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. B'shem Yeshua Adonai does the congregation agree. Amen. And may you all see.